Hello, my name is Peter. I'm from the police, or rather, I used to be from the police, and I'm here to help you. There are a few things as unscripted as a hostage situation. And believe me, if you ever get caught up in one, you're going to think that life has just served you a whole bunch of lemons. And not just if you're one of the hostages either. Your family and friends are, of course, all going to worry about what's going to happen to you and whether they'll ever see you again. And in fact, most hostage takers never actually wanted or expected to be in that situation in the first place. A bank robber, for example, was just hoping to make a quick getaway, only to be surrounded by police before he could escape. He definitely didn't wake up that morning planning to take hostages. And believe it or not, even the police think they've been just sold a bunch of lemons, because hostage situations are extremely difficult to deal with. So it's the job of the hostage negotiator to turn up and turn those lemons into lemonade, which means calming everything down so that we can get everyone out of that situation safe and unharmed. Which is why hostage negotiators always like to begin with a very simple four-sentence script. Hello, my name is Peter. I'm from the police and I'm here to help you. Why is this short script so powerful? Firstly, it allows me to begin the negotiations with a very non-threatening opening. What could be more natural than a simple greeting? Next comes personal disclosure. It's always good to share a little bit about yourself, so I tell them my name. Not Mr. Morgan, but Peter, so it sounds relaxed and informal. Of course, in Hong Kong, they would probably say Peter, sir, but for now, Peter is good. And hopefully, as we go along, Maybe they'll give me their name too. It's always nice when someone uses your name. And it's exactly the same even in a hostage situation. It makes people feel valued and important. Of course, they may not give me their real name, but it helps having something to call them. This is all much easier in Australia, of course, where everybody calls each other mate. Well, hello, mate. Good day, mate. Now it's time to add some credibility. I next tell them I'm from the police. That tells them that I'm bound by the laws of Hong Kong, police rules and regulations, not to mention the many oversight bodies that we have here, LegCo, Capo and, of course, the media. Unfortunately, in some countries, that's not always the case. But here in Hong Kong, it means we play fair and by the rules. And lastly, and perhaps the most powerful element in the pre-planned script is when I tell them, I'm here to help you. The motto of the Hong Kong Police Negotiation Unit is, who cares wins. And we take it very seriously, as we really do care that everyone comes out of this unscripted situation safe so they can all go home to their families. Obviously, in the case of the hostage taker, the family may have to go to them because they'll probably be in prison. So when hostage negotiators turn up to a hostage situation, we really want to help. Yes, even the hostage taker. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're asking yourself, does all this really work? And the answer is, heck yes. Just before the Hong Kong handover, I was the only Westerner still working in the negotiation unit and got the call that a young expat male with a history of drug abuse and mental health problems had barricaded himself inside his Wan Chai flat and was threatening to kill himself and his girlfriend, although not necessarily in that order. I was living in Discovery Bay at the time and knew it would take me at least half an hour to get to the incident. So I told the expatriate officer there to talk to the male to try and calm him down and I take over the negotiations once I arrived. I managed to get there in record time only to find that nobody was talking to him because they were all waiting for me to arrive. Deciding not to waste any more time, I got ready to begin the negotiations. First though, I had to get a tactical team prepped and ready just in case he decided to burst out of the flat with his knife and start attacking us. So once they were ready and in position, I knocked on the door and said, Hello, my name is Peter. I'm from the police and I'm here to help you. Now, his personal psychologist had arrived earlier <clears throat> and he told me, whatever I do, don't tell him that I'm in the police because he hates the police. Now, one thing negotiators do not do is lie. As somehow you always get caught out if you do that. And then any credibility you may have earned immediately goes out the window. So I decided that I would tell him I'm in the police and just take it from there. So once again, I knocked on the door and said, hello, 
My name's Peter. I'm from the police, and I'm here to help you. Why don't you put down the knife and come out so we can talk? And he said, okay. He put down the knife and he came out. To be honest, even I was a bit shocked as I was expecting to be there for quite a while, but he literally surrendered straight away, almost within 30 seconds. Obviously, everyone there thought I must be the best negotiator ever. However, just in case you think it's easy being a hostage negotiator, it's not. For a start, most negotiators are volunteers, so they do this on top of their day-to-day -day police work. There are only a few places, for example, where they have full-time police negotiators, such as the FBI and Scotland Yard. And most incidents seem to happen outside normal working hours. So, just as you're getting ready to have dinner or go to sleep, suddenly you'll get the call to respond to a new incident. Unless you've done it, it's very hard to imagine the surge of adrenaline you get as you rush to the incident, where lives may literally be in your hands. And that's why we make the recruitment and training process so tough. Not everyone is suited for this kind of work, so we want to make sure that we attract the right people. Over the years, we've had plenty of people apply just because it sounds sexy being a hostage negotiator, but they don't actually want to turn up to incidents. So if you successfully pass the selection test, you then have to attend a full-time, two-week residential program. You'll spend eight hours in the classroom learning about incident dynamics, psychological issues at incidents, basic and advanced negotiation techniques such as active listening, influencing skills, and of course, body language. You'll then spend the next eight hours practicing those techniques and skills through role play and simulations, probably finishing around one or two in the morning. Then you'll be debriefed for at least an hour on what you did well and what you did not so well. After all, it's better to make all your mistakes while under training rather than at a real incident. If you're lucky, you'll get to go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, just in time to start the next day at 0800 hours. You see, we want to test how you work when you're tired, frustrated, exhausted, hungry, and ready to give in. Because in many hostage situations, that's exactly how you'll feel. If you manage to pass the two-week course, you'll then be assigned to a crisis negotiation team for more on-the-job training and mentoring by more experienced negotiators. Each team is on call for one week in a month and can probably expect to be called out four or five times in that week. In theory, they then have three weeks off. But if there's an incident that lasts over 12 hours, one of the other teams will then be called to take over the negotiations. Some incidents can go on for days and some, although luckily not in Hong Kong, can even take weeks. Or it may be a very complicated incident that requires more negotiators to help out. There might even be several incidents taking place all at the same time, which might be the case if it's a terrorist-related incident. And hostage negotiation is not like you see in the movies, where the hero, and of course that would be me, turns up, strips down to their underpants to show that they're not carrying a gun, and then somehow disarms the hostage takers and rescues all the hostages, and all before lunch. That said, when I underwent my own hostage negotiation training, on the last day, we were put through the final test, and I had to respond to a hostage situation with hardcore terrorists wearing balaclavas and armed with Uzis and submachine guns. Even though I knew it was just an exercise, I can tell you I was pretty nervous about the whole thing and having all those guns pointed at me. I was even more nervous when they accused me of wearing a wire and demanded that I strip down to my underpants to prove that I wasn't. The exercise was being held in January at three o'clock in the morning, and it was pretty cold even here in Hong Kong. Well, determined to pass the training, that's exactly what I did. Fortunately, in those days, I was a lot younger and slimmer, and although I wasn't quite a Calvin Klein model, I still looked pretty good in my underpants. These days, they would probably immediately surrender if I threatened to strip down to my underpants. At the end of the day, though, hostage negotiation is all about teamwork. These types of incidents are extremely difficult and complicated to handle because they are so unscripted. Usually, there will be at least four negotiators at an incident, including a team leader who decides the overall negotiation strategy and advises the police commander, the primary or lead negotiator who does most of the talking, and a secondary negotiator who is there to assist and advise the negotiator, 
And lastly, we have a liaison officer who will assist with fact-finding, interviewing relatives, or such stuff. We also get a lot of support from other specialist units so we can communicate with the hostage takers. Long gone are the days when we would stand outside with the bullhorn telling them to come out with their hands up. Now we use tactical throw phones that we can literally throw into the incident location to facilitate two-way communication. We may also have psychologists at the scene to give advice on the best approach to adopt if the hostage taker has mental health problems, for example. That said, at the end of the day, is really the negotiator's own experience and gut feeling that helps bring these incidents to a close. On one occasion, we had a 60-year-old male with a long history of schizophrenia who suddenly stopped taking his medication and he had a relapse. He threatened to kill his 85-year-old mother with a meat cleaver from the kitchen, but luckily she managed to hide in the bath bathroom and call the police. When we got there, he was behind the door in a fetal position holding the knife to his throat like this. He was in such a bad way by this time that he refused to talk to us and refused to move, which meant that bursting through the door would have caused him serious injuries. We asked for advice from the psychologists who said that because of his deteriorating mental health and the fact that his mother was so old, there was really no option except to break through into the premises to subdue him. Well, that would have been pretty dangerous because we would have had to abseil down from the rooftop through the open window and the flat was on the 31st floor. Luckily, our liaison officer from the negotiation team had found his uncle, who told us that the hostage taker liked and respected him a lot. So we decided to use the uncle as a third party intermediary and explained what we wanted to do. So this time we used a slightly different script. The uncle knocked on the door and told the hostage taker he was going to play mahjong, but they were one player missing. Would he come out and join the group? Now the hostage taker recognized the uncle's voice, really liked to play mahjong, and immediately decided to come out after he put the knife down, of course, so that he could play. Which is why hostage negotiators should always keep a mahjong table in their response vehicle, just in case. By now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, this hostage negotiation stuff's pretty easy and it's not too difficult to get hostage takers to surrender and release all their hostages. Actually, it's a lot harder than I made it sound, even for very experienced and able negotiators. There was a newspaper article just a few days ago that reminded me of an incident that took place over 30 years ago. A young male from China went into a bank in Wanshai to rob it. Afterwards, he fled along Lockhart Road where he was spotted by the police. He fired at the police and then jumped onto a minibus, hoping that he'd be able to make his getaway. Unfortunately, everybody on board told him they were passengers and didn't know how to drive. In fact, they were all minibus drivers taking a tea break. Unable to drive away, he instead took them all hostage, including a seven-year-old boy who was the son of one of the drivers. Of course, the police immediately surrounded the minibus and hostage negotiators were called. I was the second negotiator to arrive, so I went to join the primary negotiator who had already taken up his position, facing the minibus so that he could talk more easily with the hostage taker. Obviously, in hindsight, we should have taken up a slightly better and safer position and considered using a throw phone. But anyway, those were the lemons we were dealt. As I approached the minibus to join my colleague, I had my hands up so the hostage taker could see that I wasn't armed. All this time, he was waving his gun at me, and as I was turning around so he could see that my back, he suddenly got very excited because he saw my pager. Because in those days, we carried the very long, old-style silver pages, and he probably thought it was the barrel of a gun. So I slowly showed it to him and assured him it was my pager and not a gun, and finally, he believed me. After that stressful moment, we got on with the negotiations at hand. My colleague was very experienced and a very capable negotiator. But for some reason, we couldn't get the hostage taker to surrender, even though it looked like he wanted to. Eventually, after about six hours, we finally found out what the problem was. He had seen too many police movies, and he was convinced that if he surrendered, he would be beaten up by police. In the end, we got him to agree to surrender if we gave him a note signed by a very senior police officer that he wouldn't be beaten up. So as a result, he finally agreed to surrender and then we beat him up. Uh, of course, I'm just joking about that. So, hostage situations, like life, can often be very unscripted. 
But if you keep your wits about you, think outside the box, perhaps keep a mahjong table handy. Have a few scripted tools and techniques at your disposal, but more importantly, you decide you really do care and you really want to help both yourself and others, suddenly it's not that hard to make lemonade from lemons. Hello, my name is Peter. I used to be in the police and I'm really here to help you. Mm -hmm.